Okay, in this video, we're gonna look at three consequences of the axiom of completeness of the real numbers. But before we do that, I wanna recall what the axiom of completeness is. So it says that every non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded above has a least upper bound. And I've put kind of an alternative statement in here, which is equivalent to the axiom of completeness in green. And that is every non-empty set of real numbers that is bounded below has a greatest lower bound. So let's just recall what those notions are first. So we say that S is the least upper bound of a set A of real numbers if it satisfies two criteria. First, S is bigger than or equal to A for all A and A. In other words, it's an upper bound of A. It is bigger than every element in A or potentially equal to one of them. And then if U is bigger than or equal to A for all A in A, then S is less than or equal to U. So in other words, if U is also an upper bound for A, then S is smaller than or equal to that upper bound. And that makes S the least upper bound. Okay, so you can have a completely analogous definition for a notion of a greatest lower bound. And I'll, I'll leave it to you as an exercise to write down, down that definition. Now, some other notation that we often use is S equals the soup of A, in other words, the supremum of A. And in the case of the greatest lower bound, we use the word infimum or sometimes shortened to nth. Okay, the first thing that we wanna prove, which is a result following from this axiom of completeness, is the so-called nested interval property. And this um, has to do with nested closed intervals. So let's look at this statement. So for all natural numbers n, suppose we have a closed interval, we'll call it i sub n. So it is bounded on the left by a sub n and on the right by b sub n. And this is just a standard closed interval. In other words, it's all real numbers x that are bigger than or equal a sub n and less than or equal to b sub n. So from like calculus one or whatever. And so these closed intervals have to satisfy the following contain containment. So we have I1 contains I2, which contains I3, and so on and so forth. So in other words, IN plus 1 is contained within IN for all natural numbers. And the conclusion here is that the intersection of all of these intervals is non-empty. Okay, so before we look at the proof, I want to look at maybe a picture and then why this does not work in the rational numbers, and then also why this does not work for open intervals. So the picture is kind of like this. So let's say we've got our real line. And so IN is this largest closed interval. So maybe this would be like A1 and B1. And so every number in between there is I1. And then with, within I1 is I2. So maybe we would put A2 here, and then we would put B2 here. And so this would be I2 and then so on and so forth. So you're nesting them tighter and tighter and tighter. So here would be maybe A3 and B3. So in other words, here we have I3. Okay, great. So that's a picture of what's going on. Now, um, the next thing I wanna look at is why this doesn't work in the rational numbers. And we can actually look at a specific example of that. Maybe if we take this example, let's let I in equal x, which are in the rational numbers that satisfy the following rule. So maybe we have x is between pi minus 1 over n and pi plus 1 over n. Great. Well, it's pretty easy to see in this case that these quote unquote intervals, they're not intervals because they only contain rational numbers, but they are nested in the same way that these are nested. But if you take their intersection, their intersection along the real numbers would be the singleton pi, but that singleton pi is not contained in the rational numbers. And so since we're only considering rational numbers here, that is not the intersection. The intersection is indeed just the empty set. Okay, great. And then another thing is why not open intervals? And we'll look at that as well. So why not open So we can do that with an example as well. So let's let i in, in this case, be the open interval 0 to 1 over n. And so obviously, this is still um, nested the same way that we need it to be. But 
If you take the intersection of all of these, you get the empty set. And again, we won't prove that super carefully, but we'll maybe look at things like that um, more carefully after we prove our main results here. Okay, so I'm gonna clean up the board and then we're gonna look at the proof of this nested interval theorem. So now let's look at the proof of this nested interval theorem. So we wanna produce two sets, one of which we can use the axiom of completeness with boundedness above and having a least upper bound and the other one with boundedness below and having a greatest lower bound. So let's consider the following sets. So let's set A equal to AN as n runs over all natural numbers. In other words, the left-hand endpoint of these intervals. And then let's say b is equal to bn, again, as n runs over all natural numbers. And so that is also going to be built off of the endpoint of this, in this case, the right endpoint. Now notice both of those are subsets of R necessarily because these intervals are subsets of R. Okay, so now I'm gonna reproduce the number line from the last board just for motivation for how we're gonna do this proof. And so let's recall that A1 to B1 was like our largest interval. In other words, it's the one that all of the others are within. So we can kind of put that on the outside. And then we know that a2, B2 is right inside of that. Again, this is because of this inclusion right here. And then we can keep going. So A3 and B3 is right here. And then maybe we'll add one more in this case. Maybe here is A4 and B4. Okay, so now we wanna apply the axiom of completeness and we'll apply it to the set A. So let's look at this little picture that we made and notice that all of the Bs, in other words, B1, B2, and in general, all of the Bns are bigger than every element in A. And that is because we have this nestedness of these intervals. And so what that means is that every one of these Bns can serve as an upper bound for the set A. So maybe let's notice that real quick. And we'll just write it in the following way. So for all natural numbers n, Bn is an upper bound for our set A. Great. But then by completeness, we know that if a set has an upper bound, it has a least upper bound. So we know A has a least upper bound. Okay, good. But then we can call that least upper bound something. So let's maybe set A equal to the supremum of A, in other words, the least upper bound of A. Now we're gonna use these two properties of the least upper bound. So since A is an upper bound of A, it is bigger than every element from this set A. So in other words, for all natural numbers n, we know that A has to be bigger than or equal to A n. Great, and so that's because A is an upper bound of this set capital A. But then, since all the B ends are also upper bounds, and this is the least such upper bound, we know that this has to be less than or equal to B sub N. So we found this number A, which is between A sub N and B sub N, and that is true for all N in N. But the fact that it's true for all N in N means that a is in fact inside this intersection of all of these natural numbers. Because what does it mean to be between A sub n and B sub n? That means A is an element of this closed interval A sub n, B sub n, which is the interval I sub n. And that is, like I said, true for all natural numbers, but it being true for all natural numbers but means that we are in the intersection of all of those closed intervals. But the existence of this A means that this intersection is non-empty, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. And so that finishes our proof. Okay, I'll clean up the board and then we'll look at another consequence of this axiom of completeness. Okay, so the next consequence we're gonna look at is called the Archimedean property. So it's got two parts. The first part says that given any real number X, there is a natural number N that is larger than that real number. So that might seem pretty obvious, but we're gonna prove it using this axiom of completeness. 
And the second part says, given any real number y that is bigger than zero, there is a natural number such that one over n is less than y. So we're gonna prove this by contradiction. In other words, we're going to look at the negation of this statement and show that it's impossible for that to be true. The negation of this statement will read as follows. There exists a real number x such that for all natural numbers n, n is less than or equal to x. And so that's equivalent to saying that the natural numbers is bounded above. And so that's the statement that we will use as our contradictory start starting point. So by way of contradiction, suppose that n is bounded above, but we view n as a subset of the real numbers. And we know by this completeness axiom that every subset of the real numbers that's bounded above has a least upper bound, in other words, a supremum. So that means in this setup, the natural numbers has a supremum. So let's go ahead and set alpha equal to this supremum of the natural numbers. Now, the next thing that we wanna notice is that if alpha is the supremum of n, then alpha minus one is not an upper bound of n. But if alpha minus one is not an upper bound of n, then that means there is a natural number that is bigger than alpha minus one. So let's take that. So there exists some natural number n such that alpha minus one is less than n. But then we can use this fact about the natural numbers that every successor of a natural number is also a natural number. And notice that that implies that alpha is less than n plus one, which itself is a natural number. But this contradicts the fact that alpha is the soup of n because we found something from the natural numbers that is bigger than alpha. So in other words, so alpha is not equal to the supremum of n, which is our contradiction. So we started with alpha is the supremum and we ended up that alpha is not able to be the supremum. In other words, the natural numbers is not bounded above, but if the natural numbers are not bounded above, then this statement holds. Okay, great. So part two follows very, very quickly from part one. And so what we'll do is we'll find some natural number n such that n is bigger than one over y. So notice if we have any non-zero real number, then we can take its reciprocal and we take its reciprocal that's still a real number and then by part one we can find a natural number that is bigger than that um, real number and that's what we've done here we've got this n which is bigger than one over y but now we can just take the reciprocal of both sides and that gives us that one over n is less than y which is exactly what we wanted okay so that finishes our proof i'll clean up the board and we're going to look at one more thing Okay, the last result that we're gonna prove that follows from this axiom of completeness is the density of the rational numbers and the real numbers. So this is a super important property. So it says that for any two real numbers A and B, where A is less than B, there is a rational number between them. In other words, there is a rational number R where A is less than R, which is less than B. Okay, great, so we're not actually gonna directly use the axiom of completeness. We will use the Archimedean principle, which followed from the axiom of completeness. We just got done proving it. Okay, so let's see how this proof goes. So let's first of all notice that since A is less than B, we have B minus A is bigger than zero. But since now we have a positive real number, we can apply that second part of the Archimedean principle. In other words, by, let's just say, Archimedean principle um, part two that was just on the previous board, there is a natural number n such that one over n is less than b minus a. Okay, so recall that this b minus a is kind of playing the role of y in that second part of the Archimedean principle. Okay, great. But now what we can do is like kind of clear the fractions here. So notice that's the same thing as one is less than b n minus a n. So now we're gonna rearrange this a little bit. So we can rearrange this um, pretty clearly to get a n plus one is less than b n. Okay, good. 
And now we're gonna focus in on this, this real number right here, which is a times n. And any real number you can kind of sandwich between two integers, and we'll do that in the following way. So let's go ahead and take an integer, and we'll call it m, such that m minus one is less than or equal to a times n, which is less than m. Okay, so like I said, we can do that kind of for any real number, we can put it in between two sequential integers. You know, maybe, maybe it may be equal to one of them, but maybe it won't and it'll lie right in the middle. Okay, so now we're gonna fuse this inequality together with this inequality. And we wanna do it in a way so that we have a n on the left and b n all the way on the right. So here we have a n is less than m, but that's going to be less than a n plus one. So let's just talk through this part real quick. So a n less than m comes from this half of this inequality, but then we can take the left half of this inequality and add one to it, and we'll get this bit down here. Okay, so that's good. And then we know a n plus one is less than b n from this bit up here. Okay, so now we're in a good spot. We can discard this a n plus one part, and we're left with a n is less than m, which is less than b n. But now what we can do is divide all parts of this by n, and we will have a is less than m over n, which is less than b. But that's exactly what we wanted to do because now we have a rational number m over n that is between these two real numbers that we started with. Okay, so that finishes this proof, and that's a good place to stop this video.